uh, the Q&A process a bit easier because I can see the people who are logged in and whether you have your hand up or have a question or things like that. Um, but if you're only on the phone, we may uh, not be able to bring you directly into the discussion via Q&A, just a limitation of the, the software and also our uh, control over the, uh, the process. So um, please do connect if you can, uh, and if not, um, I hope you still uh, are able to enjoy the presentation. Uh, we have just a few things on the agenda today. Uh, I'm going to forego trying to do introductions, um, in part because anyone who's logged into the webinar can see the folks who are connected, I believe. Uh, certainly we can. And also, it, with this audio interface, it's a little challenging. So uh, I'm going to save us some time that way and hope that uh, folks don't feel neglected, but it's purely a, a technological and a convenience thing. Um, not a, a disregard of your participation. Uh, so that was the welcome. The other, the other items we have uh, for discussion, first I'll give you a quick update on the revitalization forum we had in Detroit last month. We promised you that we would talk about it this month, uh, and we will. Um, Rebecca will send you more detail in the notes on that. Uh, we have a quick update from uh, Atlanta, Atlanta Neighborhood Development Partners about an event going on in Atlanta. We'll do that after. And then we will spend the bulk of the call on a presentation from Alana Proust uh, from Recast City. And I'm really excited for this discussion ever since she told me about the new ventures she had begun and the, uh, the maker movement that she's been exploring. I had been wanting to bring it to the task force. So uh, I'm, I, I hope you all enjoy that. But Oh, and Rebecca will uh, also have some updates on uh, federal policy for us. Uh, so I will go first, give you a, just a, the, the quickest summary of what we did in Detroit. Uh, we, uh, in partnership with uh, the folks at J.P. Morgan Chase, held a revitalization forum in Detroit, uh, which was special for me because I grew up outside the city um, and, you know, have a, a very special place in my heart for, for the great state of Michigan. Um, but I think it was also... Uh, the, a logical place to have a wide range in conversation about housing's role in revitalization. And the, the format was uh, a small discussion, right, 45, 50 people or so, the, the kind of a group where everyone can both participate in a substantive way and have time to listen and, and take insights home. Um, and it was about a 50-50 split between folks doing revitalization and housing work in Detroit and folks from outside. Uh, who may have encountered similar challenges or tried solutions that might or might not work in Detroit. And the, the goal, which I think we've largely fulfilled, was uh, connecting those two sets of people and having a, a exchange of insights going in both directions. So we had folks from Boston and Atlanta and uh, uh, some folks from the West Coast, um, uh, folks from Baltimore, uh, all places that in one way or another have seen challenges of blight and disinvestment and try different responses to them. Um, we got to hear about a bunch of great work going on in the city, um, some of which I think we will bring to this group in subsequent presentations. Uh, in particular, if any of you have seen the work of Loveland Technologies um, in creating a nearly real-time uh, database of every parcel of land in Detroit, it's pretty amazing. Um, the, the level of in understanding and control uh, that the city can get from that kind of data is, is impressive and I think has applications beyond just Detroit's challenges. So uh, I, I think I won't go into great detail on all of the topics discussed. I'll, I'll let you know we, we tackled uh, issues around single-family housing, around multifamily housing, around that the gray area of the sort of one to four unit buildings that comprise so much of the rental stock, but often are not uh, the focus of policy. Um, got to hear a great panel uh, of some of Chase, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase's partners in the city and what they've been working on. So there is a, a much more detailed blog post that has links to all the, the different folks in their presentations that Rebecca will send to you with the notes. Um, I encourage you to take a look at it and reach out to me. Our goal at NHC is uh, both to do more work in Detroit and hopefully come back with another forum or uh, some, some follow-up steps, but also to do work like this in other places. So um, if you are uh, 
part of an organization that thinks, hey, this would be a great thing to do in my city, let us know, and you know, we'll look for ways to, to try and do that um, and explore ways to, to make it happen. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I just I know many folks were interested in the work, so I think I'm going to leave it at that and let the, the notes and the blog post speak for themselves um, and turn it over to Rebecca uh, to do some policy updates. Hi, and after everyone. that, we'll go to Susan. And I know you're on the line, Susan. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to give you two brief updates in case you haven't um, seen it. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have now enhanced their guidelines for their sales of non-performing loans. I should say the Federal Housing Finance Administration has released enhanced requirements. Um, so for non-performing loan sales that they decide to sell in the future, these will be severely delinquent, so more than a year past due. And the new requirements will include bidder qualifications, modification requirements, loss mitigation waterfall requirements, REO sale requirements, and reporting requirements. So things like borrowers have to be evaluated either for making home affordable programs or for proprietary modification depending on when their loan was closed. They have to look at short sales and deeds in lieu before going to foreclosure if a loan mod is impossible. And once one of these loans becomes an REO, for the first 20 days, it can only be sold to a buyer who will occupy it as a primary residence or to a nonprofit. And servicers are going to be required to report on their results. So FHFA will see what the neighborhood outcomes are for these sales and these loans. So this is a really positive step. A number of groups advocated for some of these requirements. While, of course, they didn't get everything they wanted, there's, there's a lot of positive um, change here to really stabilize neighborhoods and improve borrower outcomes. Just like with um, some of HUD sales, the size of the loan pools and the timing, the short timing could be an issue for nonprofits who want to get involved in this space, um, which isn't addressed so far. But in terms of the borrower outcome side, this is really positive. Well, and Rebecca, this is Ethan. Um, I would add, I had a conversation with uh, one of the folks at Fannie Mae who said that they are, they understand the challenge of different pool sizes, um, and they do want to make sure that they they use different size offerings so that th there are pools that nonprofits can can take down. Now, the, you know, this was someone more on the uh, affordable uh, side of the shop, so I, I think there's a shared perspective there, and we'll see how it plays out when the, the pools actually get announced. But at least that is the, the intention going in. And, you know, I'll just echo what you said. I, I think this is a real positive step for neighborhood stabilization efforts, um, especially because the, a, lot of, um, a lot of the attention that was previously focused on REO properties, if you think back, you know, even just a year ago or less, um, is really now at the loan level before it goes into foreclosure, before, before it enters the REO space. And this is a way for... Um, the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, portfolio of non-performing loans to get into the hands of folks doing neighborhood stabilization work, whether that's nonprofits doing the work or owner occupants who are willing to uh, kind of take a chance on a neighborhood and really, really help to bring it back. Um, so I, I see this as a very positive development. Um, and we will send you links to the FHFA announcement with the notes so you can read in a little more detail uh, about what's being proposed. And then my only other update is just touch base uh, with the task force on appropriations. So the appropriation subcommittees are hard at work. They're holding hearings on different departments and their budget requests. They are collecting their dear colleague letters and member requests. All of that's happening in March. Um, and then they will start the hard work of actually setting 302A and B allocation. So as part of that, NHC is encouraging our members and task force members to sign on to the Campaign for Housing and Community Development Funding sign-on letter for the highest 302B allocation we can get for the transportation and HUD budget. And I will send out links to that in the notes. Um, the deadline to sign on is next Friday, March 13th. So please, please sign on to that letter. The more organizations we have, the better. And I'll, I'll add, just, just to give you some context on this, this is the chance to make a difference for any particular HUD program, right? If, if, if you work for an organization and maybe you, you mostly work with 202s or maybe you mostly work with a hospital program or, you know, even if it's something small, the chance to make a difference with that budget is at the, the top level of the waterfall. Um, because once that allocation to the committee is set, 
the mass kind of flows. And any other, in, any increase you get for a particular HUD program is going to come at the expense of others, most likely the block grants, the CDBG and home, uh, which fit with so many folks' work. Uh, so really the, the, the most impact we can have is this early advocacy for a larger allocation. Uh, that's what will, will free up funds to flow through all of the renewals, all of the, uh, you know, existing folks on housing assistance, and then into the, the new development and neighborhood stabilization type work. So uh, do, you know, vote early. You can't vote often, but definitely vote early. That's it for me. So if, people, if folks have questions, um, you can send them. And Susan Adams, I think we have successfully unmuted your line. Okay, can you can you hear me? I sure can. So I know you've had an announcement to share with the group. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, thank you so much, Ethan. Um, we are very excited about an event that we have coming up on March the 17th. We're going to be looking at the issue of negative equity and how it impacts Metro Atlanta. We were really driven by a Haas Institute report that showed that Metro Atlanta has the highest rate of negative equity in the country. Um, in fact, we're tied with, with Las Vegas for that distinction. But um, our rate of negative equity is about 35% of homeowners compared to about 17% nationwide. That issue is most critical in the southern part of the metro area and uh, the area south of I-20, which sort of divides Metro Atlanta into north and south. So the long and the short of it is that the housing recovery has been very uneven in our area, and significant numbers of zip codes have been heavily impacted by negative equity. And um, the other issue is that um, most of these zip codes are majority minority areas. So particularly African American households have been hard hit. And when um, you look at the statistic that for the typical African-American household, 92% of their wealth is in their home, this is even more troubling. So we're having a symposium on March the 17th at the Carter Center to look at this issue. Um, we have the CEO of NeighborWorks America, Paul Weech, participating. Um, and we also have the senior vice president from the Woodstock Institute. Woodstock has really been a leader in looking at negative equity and its long-term impacts on community stability. Spencer Cowan, he will be participating. We've got a panel of local elected officials representing jurisdictions that have been particularly hard hit by negative equity. Um, and we have got a panel that's going to talk about loan modification strategies for underwater homeowners, and then separately a, a final panel that's going to look at creating value in underwater neighborhoods. How can we elevate property um, values in these neighborhoods? So we look forward to sharing the outcomes of this conference with you, but one of our main goals is to raise awareness to the issue and look at some real regional solutions that may be effective. So thanks for the opportunity to share that. Thank you, Susan. Uh, that, it sounds like a great event. You've certainly got a, a, an excellent set of speakers lined up. Um, is any of it webcast, or if folks are outside Atlanta, is the best way to kind of hear the recap of it afterwards? Yeah, what we've done in the past is record it, so we may okay. be able to have those recorded sessions on our website afterward, our piece-by-piece -piece website. So I can let folks know about that, yeah. how they can access it. Great, and we will send around, um, you know, the announcement and, and the link to the P5P site and, and whatnot with the notes, and then hopefully uh, in the April call, uh, hear how things went. Sounds great. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So we have moved through our agenda with uh, reasonable rapidity. Uh, I'm glad of that because it gives Alana lots of time to present and discuss what she's been seeing in her work. Um, and get into some discussion with us later on. So uh, let me just give you a, a little bit of, of who she is and, and why we invited her to speak. Uh, many of you may remember um, Alana from her role uh, at Smart Growth America. Um, that's where I first encountered her, and you know there was a whole lot of work uh, around making cities, for lack of a better word, smarter, um, having them expand. Uh, with density in ways that connect housing to transportation to economic development, um, 
not the sort of thoughtless sprawl that characterizes far too many cities. Uh, she has since started uh, a company called Recast City, which is looking at economic development in a really uh, self-starting way. If those of you who are familiar with the maker movement, right, the sort of individualized, smaller, um, but also pretty high-tech manufacturing that has started up in a whole lot of places. Uh, personally, I went to the, there was a really cool maker fair in Silver Spring, Maryland, which both I and my children enjoy greatly. So uh, I think, you know, apart from the, the cool let's play with robots part of it, there's also really important implications for economic development um, and the ways this plays out particularly in, in the neighborhoods that this task force looks at a lot that are really trying to recover from periods of disinvestment. So I'm super excited to hear from Alana. Uh, in a, just a second, I will turn it over to her and let her show you the, some slides as she presents. So uh, last plea for those of you who have not connected to the webinar, to please connect to the webinar so you can see the slides. Um, there's also a Q&A box you can use um, as part of the webinar. Uh, Put some questions in there. You can do it as they occur to you. And then uh, when we get to the Q&A section, Alana can tackle those. And we will also do our best to unmute folks. If the feedback gets challenging, we will um, remute you and, and then do it selectively or something. But uh, we will endeavor to encourage as much back and forth in Q&A as we can. So with that, let me turn it over to Alana Proust. Ethan, and I'm excited to join you guys on this call today. Um, I hope most of you at this point are on the webinar because I, I love doing talks by showing lots of pretty pictures or interesting pictures. So um, this is a very visual uh, presentation, even though we're on the phone. Um, and I hope that it sparks some ideas for each of you and your work in restoring these neighborhoods and getting reinvestment in neighborhoods. As Ethan said, my background is I am, I am working. Um, can you guys hear me? We, yeah, okay. we can hear you. Keep going. Okay. Um, uh, as Ethan said, my background is in, in smart growth and in city planning. Um, and in my role at Smart Growth America, I had the chance to work with many of your organizations um, and also work with lots of different cities looking and states looking at how do we get reinvestment in our communities. And one of the thing I, things I realized over the years is that we weren't, in my opinion, looking enough at um, the jobs that people get to be able to afford to live in different kinds of neighborhoods. Um, one of the things that I'll, I'll bring up later that really struck me is how much people wanted to live in walkable neighborhoods if they could afford it. And obviously there's been a lot of conversation more recently about both disinvestment in neighborhoods but also about gentrification. And I think one of the solutions is providing more access to jobs that are diverse kinds of jobs to more people, that get people out of poverty and get them out of the system of needing assisted assistance from the public in terms of housing. So I'm going to give you a brief presentation, and then I'm excited to open this up for conversation. So housing, good jobs, and the maker movement. And I'll, I'll work on defining what I'm talking about as I go along. And hopefully this is going to move forward. Here we go. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about what we do with the creative part of our brain and how something like making origami or having a business nearby that makes gourmet handmade chocolate. That one was in Cincinnati. Um, and jobs like this where we're producing all sorts of goods for our communities or like this, which is uh, this is Kyle, and he is the executive director of a place in Cincinnati called Manufactory, which is a place you can buy membership like a gym and have access to all these different kinds of tools. This, for instance, is a CNC router um, for a pretty nominal fee. And this is, in fact, an example of a, a family three-generation business that had a printing business. And when the economy went south for them about eight years ago, about four years ago, they realized that having shared tools might be a way to help their family both stay in business and expand their offerings. And I can talk about them a little bit later. But all of these people are producing things. They're producing goods like letterpress cards. This is Melanie. Um, and libraries all over the country are starting to invest in maker spaces. And this is an opportunity where um, libraries are providing clean, high-tech, um, and, and some low-tech, like sewing machines, for people to come use in a shared space 
similar to the way that libraries have created areas for people to use computers and have access to those resources. But all of this connects to the way we have our neighborhoods develop and how we invest in the neighborhood to create great places. And having places where our friends and our family can come and gather and be a part of the community. And to me, it, direct, it directly connects back to the quality of the places that we live and the quality of our neighborhoods and our housing options. So the point I would like you to come away with, if, if nothing else, is that production in the city is key to having a strong economy. And having production in the city helps more people afford better housing. A few pieces that I'm sure you guys all know to the nth degree, but I always want to make sure that you know everyone is clear about some of the demographic trends that, that we have known, come to know and love. Right? We have an increasing number of households that will be households without children um, over the next 20 to 30 years. This will become a dominant group of our households. That means what, where people want to live, the types of service needs that they have, and even the stuff that they put in their houses and their homes is going to be different. We know from plenty of surveys, and I'm sure you've all read about the Young Professionals, the Urban Land Institute studies that show that they want to be in places where they can gather with their friends. They want to be, even with the digital generation, they want to be able to be face-to-face -face with their friends. And we know from the National Association of Realtors and their annual consumer survey that two-thirds of households would choose to live in a neighborhood where they could have where they could walk to schools and to shops and to basic services if they could afford that. And they'd gladly swap the large house on the large lot in a distant location where they have to drive to everything for that small house on a small lot where they, needed, they could walk to things. And then there's this great study I'm sure you guys are all familiar with called Soul of the Community that was done a, a few years ago that really asked why do people stay in the places that they stay? And it focused on small and medium-sized city in the Midwest and the South. Um, and it came out with three major factors. One is that the place is inclusive. You feel like you can be a part of it. The second is that there are places to gather. And the third is that there's an aesthetic about the place. It's the buildings. It's the natural environment. Right? People have an aesthetic attachment to the place. But we also have businesses that have gravitated back downtown. Um, story after story after story uh, is about businesses moving back into the city. Just yesterday in the Washington Post, I'm based here in D.C., um, there's a headline about Marriott headquarters that are in suburban Bethesda um, say, announcing that they are going to be moving locations in the next six years because they know that their young employees want to be in a metro accessible location. And then there's this thing called the maker movement that Ethan mentioned which is this amazing movement across the country to say to people, it's cool to make stuff again. Um, I would say in the 70s, it was the heyday of manufacturing. In the 80s, it was a movement towards Wall Street. And I think we can see a trend in this decade that is about making things. And the maker movement really started in the basis of both technology, but also tinkers, people who can build sort of crazy contraptions like this. Um, but what it's done is it's also created this cool factor to making stuff. And so people in cities all over the country are starting small businesses or expanding the small business that has been there for 20, 30 years, and they're making cabinets, but they're also making small drones, and they're making all sorts of things in between using high levels of technology and older kinds of tools that we've had for decades. Um, and selling them locally, nationally, and internationally. There's a few things that these businesses have in common. They're small scale. They don't have that many employees. They can sell nationally and internationally because of that crazy thing called the internet. Um, but they do pay people higher wages. Um, one of the uh, great examples of a collection of these small scale producers is in Brooklyn, and, and we'll talk about them in a minute. Um, but their, their business owners make about fifty to $60,000 a year, which if you compare that to the folks who are at minimum wage and working retail and service jobs, that's a lot better and something to think about. These same producers have all sorts of ways to sell their goods. Um, you don't have to have a retail store. You can sell online through all of these wholesale and retail spaces that are online, and some of them will even help you get connected to manufacturers. 
So there is this incredible new opportunity where we can mix these small-scale industrial uses back into the city. They're not noisy, they're not dirty, and they come in all different shapes and sizes of needed space. This can expand our job space with good paying job options, and it can help more people get out of public assisted housing and help people move up the ladders of those rungs, the rungs of those ladders. I'll give you a few examples of where this is going on. One is Pier 70. This is a, pr a development that's in the planning process in San Francisco. This is a project by Forest City. And this project is huge, it's 65 acres. But the centerpiece of this project is going to be shared space for small scale manufacturers. They want to get those small scale producers into this neighborhood because they're going to attract other people there as well. There's also Greenpoint Manufacturing and Design Center, and this is the one I mentioned to you in Brooklyn. They, in fact, are a nonprofit industrial real estate developer. They've, they've been around for 20 years. They've bought, gut, and rehab seven different buildings, and they provide affordable industrial space for producers. It's the exact same model as what happens on the affordable housing side, but with a, a number of fewer tools at their disposal. And they house over 500 small businesses within the six buildings that they still own. And this building is particularly where the woodworkers are. The businesses have their own tools predominantly, they have their own space, but because of the affordable space and the infrastructure that they can provide them, more and more of these businesses can be created in the Brooklyn area. In Brooklyn, one of the folks that's reaping the benefit of that is Industry City, which is five and a half million square feet of old industrial space that has mil hundreds of millions of dollars of deferred maintenance in them. But Jamestown, one of the an international uh, development company, uh, joined a partnership in buying these buildings and is going through the process of rehabbing them. And all of the upstairs floors are these innovation manufacturing companies. And the downstairs is retail and food production. The food production deal on the ground floor is you have to have a retail frontage and you have to have a way for people to see what you're making because people like that experience. And so they have completely bet the, house, the farm on being able to bring a significant number of uh, small-scale manufacturers into this area and providing them space really at, at significantly below market rates for their production space. Then there's models from other cities like Indianapolis. So Indianapolis has a nonprofit that created this store called Pattern, and it's to showcase local textiles, local fashion being produced in Indianapolis. And the city of Indianapolis, in fact, just provided Pattern a grant of one and a half million dollars to create a textile maker space. And what does that mean? It means a shared, a space with that will have shared tools uh, of all different kinds of tools specific to um, textile production. And this nonprofit also provides business development opportunities for the fashion textile producers. They have a magazine that they create, but it is this great opportunity for people to be able to start businesses with little to no business experience, but really have that almost incubator process in getting support for being able to expand what they do. Rockford, Illinois is one of my favorite examples because it's actually a housing authority stepping into this space. So the Rockford Housing Authority partnered with Etsy um, through a relationship that was actually brokered with them through the mayor um, to create an Etsy space in one of their um, public housing buildings. And this provides a number of different kinds of, maker, it's a, to some degree, a maker space with many different kinds of tools being provided to the, produce, the people who want to try to create different products. But it also provides business development training for them and helps them get their products onto Etsy. It's really making that direct connection from the individuals who are living in the Housing Authority building to make sure that they have a skill if they are interested in, or tools if they already have the skill, to be able to produce goods, and then helping them understand how to produce more of that and how to market it through this partnership with Etsy. It's the first time that Etsy has ever done anything like this, and really an amazing model um, of what is possible, um, both in terms of being able to promote your own residence, um, but also very specifically giving people the training to be able to help them to get out of um, public housing. So why is this important? 
and it's obvious to me, but, but I think it's important for us to, to touch upon a few of these. For neighborhood redevelopment purposes, these producers, in many cases, are an amenity. And I say that with all the love in the world. Um, these, the people who are making stuff, small scale um, to you know, 500 square feet, little spaces, to the folks who have bigger spaces that are 5,000 square feet, um, they're cool. They're creative. They bring life to a neighborhood. And the Forest City Project in San Francisco is absolutely based on this premise that if we attract the small scale producers, these maker industries to the neighborhood first, they will create a cool factor. We can do programming with them. They'll bring people out to the neighborhood. And then we can get an, a premium on the office space that we then build around that maker space, that, that maker building, um, because we've already created the cool factor for this neighborhood. So from a neighborhood redevelopment and reinvestment perspective, bringing people together who are um, producing small goods um, can be a great asset. We also know that from an economic resiliency perspective, and a lot of the neighborhoods that we're working in obviously have an issue with this, um, having more small businesses makes a city or a neighborhood much more resilient to whatever the next recession is as opposed to having one, right, it's the option of having one big uh, manufacturing company that has 5,000 employees, and when they go bust or they decided to move their plant, those 5,000 people are out of jobs, as opposed to having 1,000 different businesses that each have five employees. If something happens, you're going to lose some of those businesses, but you're not going to lose the whole crowd of them, and you're also training people in that kind of environment to become business owners themselves because they're seeing how the process happens from soup to nuts. There's also this amazing enthusiasm for local power, local, local buying power. Um, SF Made is a nonprofit in San Francisco that's sort of the big kahuna in the space, but you see it all over the country where people are excited to buy things from their neighbors, from their neighborhood. Um, they want to buy local, and this is something that I think is barely tapped so far, um, where we can make high quality custom things um, maybe some of them are more high-end, maybe some of them are not, um, but we can really tap into the resource of what is already being made in our neighborhood, in our cities. And then this lets us get to, to, to the good jobs, to good housing. Um, and I, you know, I mentioned how the, the income level for the folks at the Greenpoint Manufacturing Design Center, but the other thing to point out about them and their work is that when they surveyed their business owners, they found that 40% of their business owners do not have a college or advanced degree. And so it means that we're expanding the opportunity for good jobs and for business ownership to more people from more, more different kinds of backgrounds. And I think that's an important step to make sure that more people have access to good housing, but also as a step to reinvest in our neighborhood. There's a lot of challenges to this, though, and it's one of the things that drew me to do this work um, with Recast City. One is that um, there's no industry identity. These small-scale manufacturers, for the most part, unless you're in Brooklyn and in San Francisco, are operating under the radar. They're, they each know a few more people who are doing it, but there's no coordinated business sector support to this small-scale manufacturing sector. There's no, there's no or little municipal support. Um, there's very little peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, you can see the, the difference that peer-to-peer -peer support can make in the tech community. So tech startups have been very purposeful about creating peer-to-peer -peer networks and peer-to-peer -peer support across entrepreneurs within the tech sector. The same thing needs to happen within um, the small-scale production world as well to help both attract more businesses as well as grow the ones that are there. Um, and there's no partnership that's across cities that are doing small-scale manufacturing sector so that they can source materials across, you know, from Hoboken to Cincinnati to Omaha. Um, if they need uh, plastic injection molding, can they find a producer in one of those cities that can help them out? And in many cases, there's a limited availability of leases for manufacturing. Um, either in bigger cities like San Francisco, the costs are very high for these places, um, or in smaller cities, um, the, the buildings might have gone into disrepair because they were old industrial buildings and they haven't been kept in good state of repair. 
And before we, I talk about how we create it, I, I think it's important to think about um, how we integrate these things into neighborhoods. Forest City uh, is a great example of using these kinds of small scale um, producers as a centerpiece to a much larger neighborhood. But I do see the potential of being able to do like what Rockford Public Housing Authority did, take smaller uses of it and integrate it into housing and office individual properties as part of the shared use space. Um, it's just that these small scale producers don't, can't pay market rent uh, that are the same as retail or office in a lot of markets, but they could be the first ones in to neighborhoods that really need reinvestment. Um, but need some organizing force to really help them make a neighborhood pop. So we have to zone for it. In a lot of places, there is industrial zoning. Um, often, the industrial zones are very porous, I would say, in terms of how we define the zone. Um, you can put hotels in them. You can put retail in them. And as soon as a, a neighborhood starts to succeed in its redevelopment, a lot of these properties turn into apartments or office space, and the small-scale manufacturers can't afford it anymore. So we have to make sure we're really looking at our zoning carefully to make, to make this both allowed in other spaces, um, but also to protect the, the spaces that are specific to it. We also need to provide financing for it. So things like new market tax credits can be used for uh, shared uh, manufacturing spaces. Lots of cities have industrial activity bonds that can be used for it. We can create local venture capital funds to help support small manufacturing growth. And in a lot of cases, there are local arts credits where many of these are considered artists because they're artisans. They're producing handmade goods, um, even though that's something that could grow into a larger business. It's important to work with communities on uh, the kinds of businesses that are true to their history. So some places like in Memphis, there's a, a major Caterpillar uh, machining uh, manufacturing plant. There's a lot of both engineers and people who know how to work with metal. It's sort of a no-brainer. Actually, I think that's Winston-Salem. Um, it's a no-brainer for them to be able to expand into different kinds of industries that would build on that kind of technology or that kind of knowledge base um, versus areas that might specialize in biotech or textiles or furniture. It doesn't need to be the only kind of work being done, but it's certainly the place where I would love to have leadership um, from within the community to help expand the business base. We also need to provide all sorts of business development support. Um, the nonprofit industrial developer is one model of it. Uh, Kickstarter online is a great place for businesses to get started, as well as Indiegogo. Um, there's a, the nonprofit model like SF Made, where it's really a, a community organizing nonprofit for this small scale producer business sector. Um, and then Startup Communities is actually a great book uh, created for the tech community um, that has great lessons about how do we organize the business owners as the entrepreneurs to lead this, this work and to create that network of peer-to-peer -peer relations so that they can promote their own work. And we need to provide job training and outreach for this. Um, there's a lot of people in some cities who might have older skills that need to be updated a little bit. Um, there might be people who are interested in getting into this field um, or just never had a chance to get the training. And so there's great apprenticeship programs and journeyman programs that are popping up in different parts of the country that help both bring new staff and skilled labor into the small businesses that are already there, the small scale producers. Um, but also ones that are training new ones. So one example in Pontiac, Michigan, is a company called Dassey Solutions. And they actually build and create three, all different kinds of 3D printers, from desktop to huge industrial ones. And they heard from their manufacturing clients that there weren't enough people who knew how to operate the machines. And so Dassey Solutions partnered with the Department of Labor and this year announced a two-year hands-on training program to teach people how to operate these machines and then be placed in jobs within the manufacturing community that is their client base. And so that's just one example of the kind of direction we can go with this work. And it's important to remember that there are all different kinds of people in our community that are already involved in this kind of work, you know, from uh, the things that connect to our shipping yards to the folks, this is actually building a watch at Shinola in, in Detroit, even though it looks like she's doing biotech work. 
um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to, to get at this from um, folks doing hand-stitched bags um, and watches uh, to people who are doing furniture and metalwork, to people who are doing the connection with technology and drones and the Internet of Things where we start connecting technology to all sorts of things we're building and integrating them into it. I think the opportunity is really quite vast and the exciting thing to me is that as I've um, been working with different and talking to different cities and real estate developers across the country, people recognize that this is uh, something that's moving now and moving fast and that um, they recognize that they want to figure out how to harness these small scale producers as an economic engine within their community and how to use it really to get reinvestment in the target neighborhoods that they want to support. Um, Hoboken and Cincinnati are just two places that are you know, really trying to figure this out and, and figure out how to get these businesses into redevelopment projects specifically. So with that, I will take a breath um, and I will open it up for questions. Thank you, Alana. That was really fascinating. <laughs> OK, apologies for that. We seem to have unmuted and they created a lot of feedback. So what we'll do is unmute selectively for questions. And while Rebecca's uh, looking at the question box and figuring out uh, who's coming next, let me start with questions. Um, you may need to make sure you unmute Alana, too. Um, so I, I, while we are sorting out the unmuting there, um, my question for you is about the job training aspect you brought up. I, I saw that um, from the slides, there, there, there there's probably a range of job training opportunities that could enhance this kind of maker movement. And I'm trying to think about the stuff that affordable housing providers could do, right? The, the things that could happen at a property level or that could happen, um, you know, through a community services organization, ways to make it both a, a property amenity and an economic development and revitalization tool. It, have you seen examples of things that uh, either public housing authorities or private property owners are doing for job training? The maker space uh, concept in Rockford with the public housing authority there is, is the first of its kind that I've seen. And I think they are really, um, I think May is maker month in Rockford, Illinois. They're, they're, the mayor there is really trying to use this as an economic mobilizing tool um, you know, the, and the makerspace in the library in Cincinnati just launched, I think, two months ago. Um, but it was very interesting. I had a chance to be in the Cincinnati library, their downtown library, and see their makerspace. And they have um, a very diverse clientele um, coming to use, uh, you know, a huge plot printer, um, 3D printers, um, the sewing machine and I was talking to the guy who helps run the space and and you know he said when they first opened um, he was shocked shocked in a good way and surprised um, the first person who came in to use the sewing machine that they have in their in their space in the library was this guy in his in his his uh, an individual of color in his mid 60s who came in to use the sewing machine because he'd been working on a blanket as a present and it wasn't for a business perspective, it was a personal use thing, but his sewing machine had broken and he had heard about the space opening and had come down to use it. And so I think that the more we make um, even some of the more, most basic tools available as part of our public good and public space, um, the more we can then also reach out to those people and say, okay, if you have this skill, how do you then turn that into a business opportunity? How can you use the Etsy model? How can you use another model? Can we create a partnership between this group of people and one of the local retailers to source some products? Um, so I think that it does need to be a combination of providing people with access to a core set of tools, um, but also the opportunity to have training about business development. I think from a skilled labor perspective, for instance, knowing how to use a CNC router uh, or, um, 
you know, a, a large scale 3D printer or some of the more high tech robotic things, um, those have to be much more specific trainings, um, but it doesn't need to start there. Right, right. Although um, CNC routers are really cool, and I'm hoping that at some point <laughs> I get training because I totally want to use one. Um, I've, I've seen them. It's, it's the precision with, with which they can uh, cut virtually any material if properly configured is pretty pretty impressive. Um, all right, let me. Right. While well, uh, folks are gathering their questions, let me change gears and ask you a, a different question. Um, if you think back, you know, to the 18th century, 19th century, retail was quite often combined with housing, right? It was people living above right. their income. And I'm wondering how much of that either you're starting to see or you think we might see, in part because it has financing implications for affordability. And it also has, you know, whether the, the shop income helps you finance the housing or whether it's the housing equity allows you to finance the startup of a business, that the linkage between the two uh, can be powerful. I agree that it can be very powerful. Um, what I have seen so far is that, um, let's see how to organize my thoughts on this. Um, I think we're going to see mixed use with industrial in a very short amount of time, uh, within the next couple of years. Um, if I think back 20 years ago when we, you know, people were panicking when they, when we talked about doing new retail ground floor and apartments above, um, people couldn't figure out how to finance it. It was too complicated. The, the banks didn't like it, um, but we figured it out. And it's one of the things that was the secret sauce of creating walkable neighborhoods and reinvestment in neighborhoods is because we figured out that financing. I think we're going to figure it out for mixed-use industrial properties as well. Um, I actually don't know if that means that we're going to have uh, subsidies like we do with affordable housing. So if you could we create a, a policy that says if you include X percent space for affordable industrial, small-scale industrial within your building, then you can add X, Y density of office. Uh, mm -hmm. to the building. Maybe that. Maybe we create a program like that. Um, the other model that I've been looking at is where you have shallow retail frontage and you have uh, small scale producers behind them so that you still get the, as a building owner, you still get the revenue from retail up front, um, but you are looking at how to uh, underwrite the space in the back uh, differently. Um, I do also think that we'll see it as uh, neighbors so that we can see, to some degree, separate buildings that are uh, small-scale producer buildings next to residential buildings, because um, they do bring a cool factor to the neighborhood. Um, or we'll see a retail frontage that is very micro uh, retail frontage, um, which is, I think, a lot, a lot of older buildings. You can see this where you know, the retail space is 500 square feet, not 5,000 square feet. Um, and you can, it's just enough space for people to be producing in the back of that space and selling up front, um, which is an, another very different kind of model. Right. That's a more traditional sort of small shop model. Yeah. Right. Um, I want to, I want to, let me pick up on the, the cool factor you mentioned, because that came up in your presentation too, and it, it ties to something that we've discussed um, in Restoring Neighborhoods, some, the, the kind of rebranding of a neighborhood. And I, I would right. love your thoughts on how, you know, this, this sort of new industrial development connects to that, especially in ways where it, we can see revitalization without displacement, right, gentrification without displacement. Yeah. Because that's, that's the sweet spot everyone's aiming at, but thus far it's, it's proving somewhat elusive. Well, I think the, the key step in succeeding with that is finding the businesses that are already in the neighborhood. Finding the people who are in the neighborhood who are either working somewhere where they're producing something or producing from home, which we know is very should happens very traditionally um, in neighborhoods, um, and providing people with super low cost space to come out from their homes or from you know the the basement spaces and be in retail frontages and help and give them business development support um, to help them grow what they're already doing. 
Um, so I think the number one thing is is really doing the nitty gritty, and it's hard, um, the nitty gritty research to find the folks in the neighborhood who are already producing. I think the second piece is to really activate the space. So that's all sorts of event programming that speaks to the people in the neighborhood but draws people from outside the neighborhood um, but, uh, but invites the people from the neighborhood to really promote what they're selling, what they're doing, what they're producing as a, as a primary step in that um, so that it appeals to the people in the neighborhood who are already there um, and can then obviously expand the process as well. Um, and some real estate developers really understand that um, if we invest in that kind of active, interesting retail frontage, that the residential neighborhood um, doesn't necessarily mean that the values have to go through the roof, but it means that people potentially will spend more money in uh, reinvesting in the properties that they do have or that when properties do turn over, you can attract new people to the neighborhood. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let me let me ask one more question. I, I don't want to totally monopolize this, but I'm not seeing hands up, so I want to make sure I get this one out there. If someone's here, you know, on this call now, or listening to the recording later, or seeing the notes from the task force, and they go, "Wow, I'm in that affordable housing space. This sounds really interesting. I'd like to connect what I do more with it. Um, you know, whether as an owner or a property manager or a uh, nonprofit doing uh, housing counseling or you know services, where would they get started, right? If they're pretty new to the concept but find it almost as intriguing as I find it, um, what, what's <laughs> the best step? What, are, what, are there resources? Are there folks at HUD working on it? Is it talk to you? What, where do they go? Um. I don't have very many answers for that um, because I reached this point by pulling in a lot of different ideas that I had seen um, be mm -hmm. exciting while I was at Smart Growth America um, from the small business perspective and the local production perspective all the way across to real estate and reinvestment in our neighborhoods. Um, there are very few people in the country who are working on this. I think the, the real estate developers that I mentioned in the presentation, both the for-profit and the non-profit developers, are great resources to understand more how to do this from a real estate perspective. But mm -hmm. obviously, um, I launched I launched Recast City um, to be able to make those connections, and I'm happy to be a resource for people. Um, I'm particularly focused on working with cities and uh, housing authorities and different civic leadership as well as real estate developers and the private sector uh, to figure out how to integrate these uses back into the city and use it as a way both to redevelop neighborhoods, get reinvestment in key real estate, but also grow our local job space. Got it. Well, we will make sure that they get your website uh, along with the presentation. I will also say I mean, I've seen, like in Silver Spring, things like the Maker Fair. There are places where folks interested in this sort of, you know, small-scale, high-tech industrial activity gather, and uh, that can be a good way to just get a taste of what it's all about and see all the cool stuff they're doing and stimulate ideas and, and make connections with people in your community who are doing it. Absolutely, and if people are interested in the Maker Movement itself, um, the maker movement itself doesn't have a connection to the redevelopment side. They don't. They don't right. see that yet, but they will soon. Um, but you know, there's Maker Magazine and there's local maker fairs, um, and then places like Etsy are a great way to start finding the local businesses that are already in your area producing these things. It's at least a good starting point to look at Etsy and at Kickstarter um, to see who is producing things within your city. Just as a right. as a quick jump exactly. in. Yeah, uh, and and I will say, I mean, I think I think you're right. They're they're starting to get it. That the descriptions I have read of maker spaces, especially the the more industrial ones, right, the ones with that need a little bit more space and and have kind of higher power demands, that sort of thing, are kind of naturally gravitating to redevelopment areas because it's because it's affordable. There's usually formerly industrial space or warehouse space. You know, the stuff that you often find in um, uh, older, less uh, older neighborhoods that have seen less investment, and uh, there is there is somewhat of a natural fit there.
So I'm going to look one more time at the question box, see if anyone's got their hand up. A moment ago they did not, but I want to make sure we're, we're hitting everything. Um, well, I, I merely see enthusiastic praise, which is wonderful, and I appreciate it. So I, I think with that, um, we, we, we will close a little bit early. Alana, thank you very much. This is fascinating stuff. I'm excited to share your slides with the group um, as well as your contact info. It'll go, you know, not only to everyone who's on the webinar now, but to the pretty long list of folks who are uh, subscribed to the Story Neighborhood Task Force list. Um, so hopefully we will generate some more interest. I would say uh, if folks coming out of this in your own investigations have ideas for uh, how to build on this, right, ways to connect it more to our work, whether it's on the public housing side for CHAs that are creating spaces or for private uh, property managers or owners who, who want to create some of this or folks in the, on the service side. Um, I'm interested in talking more. I'm sure Alana is as well, maybe others uh, in the group. So uh, reach out and start thinking about it and, and hopefully some interesting work will come with it. Thank you, Ethan. Oh, thank you. Uh, again, I appreciate you doing it. And um, folks, uh, stay tuned for notes to come and announcements for topics for next month's call. Thank you for joining us.